Poem One of the Bush Debate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Borderland by Henry Lawson. I am back from up the country, very sorry that I went, seeking for the southern poet's land, whereon to pitch my tent. I have lost a lot of idols which were broken on the track, burnt a lot of fancy verses, and I am glad that I am back. Further out may be the pleasant scenes of which our poets boast, but I think the country's rather more inviting round the coast. Anyway, I'll stay at present at a boarding house in town, drinking beer and lemon squashes, taking baths and cooling down. Sunny plains, great Scott, those burning wastes of barren soil and sand with their everlasting fences stretching out across the land. Desolation where the crow is, desert where the eagle flies, paddocks where the lunny bullock starts and stares with reddened eyes, where in clouds of dust enveloped, roasted bullock drivers creep slowly past the sun-dried shepherd, dragged behind his crawling sheep. Stunted peak of granite gleaming, glaring like a molten mass turned from some infernal furnace on a plain devoid of grass. Miles and miles of thirsty gutters, strings of muddy water holes in place of shining rivers, walled by cliffs and forest bowls, range of ridges, gullies, ridges, barren where the maddened flies, fiercer than the plagues of Egypt, swarm about your blighted eyes. Bush, where there is no horizon, where the buried bushman sees nothing, nothing but the sameness of the ragged, stunted trees. Lonely hut, where drought's eternal, suffocating atmosphere, where the god-forgotten hatter dreams of city life and beer. Treacherous tracks that trap the stranger. Endless roads that gleam and glare. Dark and evil-looking gullies hiding secrets here and there. Dull, dumb flats and stony rises where the toiling bullocks bake. And the sinister goanna, the lizard and the snake. Land of day and night, no morning freshness and no afternoon. For the great white sun in rising bringeth summer heat in June. Dismal country for the exile, when the shades begin to fall from the sad, heart-breaking sunset to the new chum, worst of all. Dreary land in rainy weather, with the endless clouds that drift over the bushman like a blanket that the Lord will never lift. Dismal land when it is raining, growl the floods and oh, the whoosh of the rain and the wind together on the dark bed of the bush, Ghastly fires in lonely humpies where the granite rocks are piled in the rain-swept wildernesses that are the wildest of the wild. Land where gaunt and haggard women live alone and work like men till their husbands, gone a-droving, will return to them again. Homes of men, if home had ever such a God-forgotten place, where the wild selectors' children fly before a stranger's face, Home of tragedy applauded by the dingo's dismal yell. Heaven of the shanty keeper, fitting fiend for such a hell. And the wallaroos and wombats, and of course the curlew's call, and the lone sundowner tramping, ever onward through it all. I am back from up the country, up the country where I went, seeking for the southern poet's land whereon to pitch my tent. I have left a lot of broken idols out along the track. Burnt a lot of fancy verses, and I am glad that I am back. I believe the southern poet's dream will not be realised till the plains are irrigated and the land is humanised. I intend to stay at present, as I said before, in town, drinking beer and lemon squashes, taking baths and cooling down. End of Borderland Poem 2 of The Bush Debate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Algie Pug In Defence of the Bush by Banjo Patterson On reading Henry Lawson's Borderland So you're back from up the country, Mr Lawson, where you went, and you're cursing all the business in a bitter discontent. Well, we grieve to disappoint you, and it makes us sad to hear that it wasn't cool and shady, and there wasn't plenty beer. And the loony bullock snorted when you first came into view. Well, you know it's not so often that he sees a swell like you. And the roads were hot and dusty, and the plains were burnt and brown, and no doubt you're better suited drinking lemon squash in town. Yet, perchance, if you should journey down the very track you went, in a month or two at furthest, you would wonder what it meant. Where the sun-baked earth was gasping like a creature in its pain, you would find the grasses waving like a field of summer grain. And the miles of thirsty gutters blocked with sand and choked with mud, you would find them mighty rivers with a turbid sweeping flood. For the rain and drought and sunshine make no changes in the street, in the sullen line of buildings and the ceaseless tramp of feet. But the bush hath moods and changes as the seasons rise and fall, and the men who know the bushland, they are loyal through it all. But you found the bush was dismal and a land of no delight. Did you chance to hear a chorus in the shearers' huts at night? Did they rise up William Riley by the campfire's cheery blaze? Did they rise him as we rose him in the good old droving days? And the women of the homesteads and the men you chanced to meet, were their faces sour and saddened like the faces in the street? And the shy selector children, were they better now or worse than the city urchins mentioned who would greet you with a curse? Is not such a life much better than the squalid street and square where the fallen women flaunt it in the fierce electric glare, where the seamstress plies her sewing till her eyes are sore and red in a filthy, dirty attic toiling on for daily bread? Did you hear no sweeter voices in the music of the bush than the roar of trams and buses and the war-whoop of the push? Did the magpies rouse your slumbers with their carols sweet and strange? Did you hear the silver chiming of the bell-birds on the range? But, perchance, the wild bird's music by your senses was despised, for you say you'll stay in townships till the bush is civilised. Would you make it a tea-garden and on Sundays have a band where the blokes might take their donners with the public close at hand? You had better stick to Sydney and make merry with the push, for the bush will never suit you, and you'll never suit the bush. The Banjo End of In Defence of the Bush On reading Henry Lawson's Borderland Poem number three of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills The Fact of the Matter by Edward Dyson The Fact of the Matter I'm wondering why those fellers who go building chipper ditties about the rosy times are droving and the dust and death of cities. Don't sling the bloomin' office, strike some drover for a billet, and soak up all the glory that comes handy while they fill it. Perhaps it's fun to travel cattle, or to picnic with merinos, but the drover don't catch on, sir, not much high-class rapture he knows. As for sleeping on the plains there in the shadow of the spear-grass, that's liked best by the juggins with a spring bed and a pier-glass. And the campfire, and the freedom, and the blanky constellations, the possum rog and billy and the togs and stale old rations it's strange they're only raved about by coves that dress up pretty and sport a wife and live on slap up tucker in the city i've tickled beef in my time clear from clark to riverina and shifted sheep all round the shop 
but blow me if I've seen a single blanky hand who didn't buck at pleasures of this kidney, and wouldn't trade his blisses for a flutter down in Sydney. Night watches are delightful when the stars are really splendid, to the chap who's fresh upon the job, but you bet his rapture's ended when the rain comes down in sluice heads, or the cutting hailstones pelter, and the sheep drift off before the wind and the horses strike for shelter. Don't take me for a howler, but I find it come annoying to hear these fellers rave about the pleasures we're enjoying, when perhaps we've nothing better than some fluky water handy, and there ride on all the liquors, rum and plenty beer and brandy. The town is dusty, maybe, but it isn't worth the curses, sighed the dust a fella swallows and the blinded thirst he nurses when he's on the hard macadam, where the jumbucks cannot browse and the wind is in his whiskers and he follows twenty thousand. This drove in on the plain, too. It's all okay when the weather isn't hot enough to curl the soles right off your upper leather, or so cold that when the morning wind comes hissing through the grasses, you can feel it cut your eyelid like a whiplash as it passes. Then there's bull ants in the blankets, and a lame horse and mosquitoes, and a DT boss like Halligan, or one like Humpy Peters, who is mean about the tucker, and can curse from start to sundown, and can fight like fifty devils, and whose growlers never run down. Yes, I wonder why the fellas what go building chipper diddies, about the rosy times out droving, and the dust and death of cities. Don't sling the blummin' office! Strike all Peters for a billet, and soak up all the glory that comes handy while they fill it. End of The Fact of the Matter Poem 4 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. In Answer to Banjo and Otherwise by Henry Lawson It was pleasant up the country, Mr. Banjo, where you went, for you sought the greener patches and you travelled like a gent, and you cursed the trams and buses and the turmoil of the push, though you know the squalid city needn't keep you from the bush. But we lately heard you singing of the plains where shade is not, and you mentioned it was dusty. All is dry, and all is hot. True, the bush hath moods and changes, and the bushman hath them too. For he is not a poet's dummy, he's a man, the same as you. And his back is growing rounder, slaving for the absentee. And his toiling wife is thinner than a country wife should be. For we noticed that the faces of the folks we chanced to meet should have made a greater contrast to the faces in the street, and, in short, we think the bushman's being driven to the wall, and it's doubtful if his spirit will be loyal through it all. Though the bush has been romantic, and it's nice to sing about, there's a lot of patriotism that the land could do without. Sort of British workman nonsense, that you'll perish in the scorn of the drover who is driven, and the shearer who is shorn of the struggling western farmers who have little time for rest and are ruined on selections in the squatter-ridden west. Droving songs are very pretty, but they merit little thanks from the people of a country which is ridden by the banks. And the rise and fall of seasons suits the rise and fall of rhyme, but we know the western seasons do not run on schedule time, for the drought will go on drying while there's anything to dry, then it rains until you fancy it would bleach the sunny sky. Then it pelters out of reason, for the downpour day and night nearly sweeps the population to the great Australian bight. It is up in northern Queensland that the seasons do their best, but it's doubtful if you ever saw a season in the West. There are years without an autumn or a winter or a spring. There are broiling dunes and summers where it rains like anything. In the bush my ears were open to the singing of the bird, but the carol of the magpie was a thing I never heard. Once the beggar roused my slumbers in a shanty, it is true, but I only heard him asking, Who the blanky blanky you? And the bell bird in the ranges, but his silver chime is harsh when it's heard beside the solo of the curlew in the marsh. 
Yes, I heard the shearers singing William Riley out of tune, saw him fighting round a shanty on a Sunday afternoon, but the bushman isn't always trapping brumbies in the night, nor is he forever riding when the morn is fresh and bright, and he isn't always singing in the humpies on the run, and the campfire's cheery blazes are a trifle overdone. We have grumbled with the bushman round the fire on rainy days, when the smoke would blind a bullock, and there wasn't any blaze save the blazes of our language, for we cursed the fire in turn till the atmosphere was heated, and the wood began to burn. Then we had to wring our blueys, which were rotting in the swags, and we saw the sugar leaking through the bottom of the bags, and we couldn't raise a chorus for the toothache and the cramp. Well, we spent the hours of darkness draining puddles round the camp. Would you like to change with Clancy? Go a droving. Tell us true, for we rather think that Clancy would be glad to change with you and be something in the city, but would give your muse a shock to be losing time and money through the foot rot in the flock. And you wouldn't mind the beauties underneath the starry dome if you had a wife and children and a lot of bills at home. Did you ever guard the cattle when the night was inky black and it rained, and icy water gently trickled down your back till your saddle-weary backbone fell a-aching to the roots and you almost felt the croaking of the bullfrog in your boots? Sit and shiver in the saddle, curse the restless stock, and cough till a squatter's irate dummy canted up to warn you off. Did you fight the drought and pleuro when the seasons were asleep, felling she-oaks all the morning for a flock of starving sheep, drinking mud instead of water, climbing trees and lopping boughs for the broken-hearted bullocks and the dry and dusty cows? Do you think the bush was better in the good old droving days, when the squatter ruled supremely as the king of western ways, when you got a slip of paper for the little you could earn, but were forced to take provisions from the station in return. When you couldn't keep a chicken at your humpy on the run, for the squatter wouldn't let you, and your work was never done. When you had to leave the missus in a lonely hut forlorn while you rose up Willie Riley, in the days ere you were born. Ah, we read about the drovers and the shearers and the like, till we wonder why such a happy and romantic fellow's strike... Don't you fancy that the poets ought to give the bush a rest, ere they raise a just rebellion in the overwritten West, where the simple-minded bushman gets a meal and bed and rum just by riding round reporting phantom flocks that never come, where the scalper, never troubled by the war-whoop of the push, has a quiet little billet breeding rabbits in the bush, where the idle shanty-keeper never fails to make a draw and the dummy gets his tucker through provisions in the law. Where the labour agitator, when the shearers rise in might, makes his money sacrificing all his substance for the right. Where the squatter makes his fortune and the seasons rise and fall, and the poor and honest bushman has to suffer for it all. Where the drovers and the shearers and the bushman and the rest never reached the El Dorado of the poets of the West. And you think the bush is purer, and that life is better there, but it doesn't seem to pay you, like the squalid street and square. Pray inform us, Mr. Banjo, where you read in prose or verse of the awful city urchin who would greet you with a curse. There are golden hearts in gutters, though their owners lack the fat, and will back a teamster's offspring to outswear a city brat. Do you think we're never jolly where the trams and buses rage? Did you hear the gods in chorus when Retural held the stage? Did you catch a ring of sorrow in the city urchin's voice when he yelled for Billy Elton, when he thumped the floor for Royce? Do the bushmen down on pleasure miss the everlasting stars when they drink and flirt and so on in the glow of private bars? What care you if fallen women? God help em, let em flaunt, and the seamstress seems to haunt you. To what purpose does she haunt? You've a down on trams and buses, on the roar of em, you said, and the filthy, dirty attic, where you never toiled for bread, and about that self-same attic, tell us, Banjo, where you've been, for the struggling needlewoman mostly keeps her attic clean, 
but you'll find it very jolly with the cuff and collar push and the city seems to suit you while you rave about the bush henry lawson p s you'll admit that up the country more especially in drought isn't quite the eldorado that the poets rave about yet at times we long to gallop where the reckless bushman rides in the wake of startled brumbies that are flying for their hides long to feel the saddle tremble once again between our knees and hear the stock whips rattle just like rifles in the trees long to feel the bridle leather tugging strongly in the hand and to feel once more a little like a native of the land and the ring of bitter feeling and the jingling of our rhymes isn't suited to the country nor the spirit of the times let us go together droving and returning if we live try to understand each other while we reckon up the div h l end of in answer to banjo and otherwise poem five of the bush debate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by timothy ferguson the overflow of clancy written by h h c c probably henry lawson subtitle on reading banjo's clancy of the overflow i've read the banjo's letter and i'm glad he found a better billet than he had upon the station where i met him years ago he was slushy then for scotty but the bushland sent him dotty so he rose up william riley and departed down below he rolled up very gladly for he had bush fever badly when he left the smoke to wander where the wattle blossoms wave but a course of stag and brownie seems to make the bush struck towny kinder weaken on the wattle and the bushman's lonely grave safe in town he spins romances of the bush until one fancies that it's all top boots and chorus kegs of rum and whips of grass and the sheep off camp go stringing when the boss in charge is singing whilst we blow the cool tobacco smoke and watch the white wreaths pass yet i guess the bee feels fitter in a build shirt and a hard hitter than he would weigh down the cooper in a flannel smock and moles for the city cove has leisure to indulge in stocks of pleasure but the drover's only pastime is cooking what's this on the coals and the pub hath friends to meet him and between the acts they treat him while he's swapping fairy twisters with the girls behind their bars and he sees a vista splendid when the ballet is extended and at night he's in his glory with the comic opera stars i'm sitting very weary on a log before a dreary little fire that's feebly hissing neath a heavy fall of rain and the wind is cold and nipping and i curse the ceaseless dripping as i slosh around for wood to start the embers up again and in place of beauty's greeting i can hear the dismal bleating of a ewe that's sneaking out among the marshes for her lamb and for the poet's skiting that a new chum takes delight in the drover's share of pleasure isn't worth a tinker's dam does he sneer at bricks and mortar when he's squatting in the water after riding fourteen hours beneath the sullen weeping sky does he look aloft and thank it as he spreads his sullen blanket for the drover has no time to spare he has no time to dry if the banjo's game to fill it he's welcome to my billet he can take a turn at droving wages three and six a day and his throat'll get more gritty than mine will in the city where with mr lawson squashes i can wash the dust away h h c c end of the overflow of clancy poem six of the bush debate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Banjo of the Overflow by Francis Kenna I had written him a letter 
which I had for want of better, knowledge given to a partner by the name of Greenhide Jack. He was shearing when I met him, and I thought perhaps I'd let him know that I was stiff, and maybe he would send a trifle back. My request was not requited, for an answer came indicted on a sheet of scented paper and an ink fancy blue, and the envelope, I fancy, had an esquire to the clancy, and it simply read, I'm busy, but I'll see what I can do. To the vision land I can go, and I often think of Banjo, of the boy I used to shepherd in the not so long ago. He was not the bushman's kidney, and among the crowds of Sydney, he'll be more at home than mooning on the dreary overflow. He has clients now to fee him, and his friends to come and see him. He can ride from morn to evening in the padded handsome cars, and he sees the beauties blending where the throngs are never ending, and at night the wondrous women in the everlasting bars. I am tired of reading prattle of the sweetly lowing cattle, stringing out across the open with the bushmen riding free. I am sick at heart of roving up and down the country droving, and of alternating damper with the salt junk and the tea. And from sleeping in the water on the droving trips I've caught a lively dose of rheumatism in my back and in my knee. And in spite of verse, it's certain that the sky's a leaky curtain. It may suit the banjo nicely, but it never suited me. And the bush is very pretty when you view it from the city, but it loses all its beauty when you face it on the pad. And the wildernesses haunt you, and the plains extended daunt you, till at times you come to fancy that the life will drive you mad. But I somehow often fancy that I'd rather not be clancy, that I'd like to be the banjo where the people come and go, when instead of framing curses, I'd be writing charming verses, though I scarcely think he'd swap me, banjo the overflow. K. End of Banjo of the Overflow Poem 7 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug In Answer to Various Bards by Banjo Patterson An Answer to Various Bards Well, I've waited mighty patient till they all came rolling in, Mr. Lawson, Mr. Dyson, and others of their kin, with their dreadful dismal stories of the overlander's camp, how his fire is always smoky and his boots are always damp, and they paint it so terrific it would fill one's soul with gloom, but you know they're fond of writing about corpses and the tomb. So, before they curse the bushland, they should let their fancy range, and take something for their livers, and be cheerful for a change. Now, for instance, Mr Lawson, well, of course, we almost cried at the sorrowful description how his little Arvey died, and we lacrimosed in silence when his father's mate was slain. Then he went and killed the father, and we had to weep again. Ben Duggan and Jack Denver too, he caused them to expire, and he went and cooked the gander of Jack Dunn of Never Tire. So, no doubt, the bush is wretched if you judge it by the groan of the sad and soulful poet with a graveyard of his own. And he spoke in terms prophetic of a revolution's beat, when the world should hear the clamour of those people in the street. But the shearer chaps who start it, why, he rounds on them in blame, and he calls them agitators who are living on the game. But I overwrite the bushman. Well, I own without a doubt that I always see a hero in the man from furthest out. I could never contemplate him through an atmosphere of gloom, and a bushman never struck me as a subject for the tomb. If it ain't all golden sunshine where the wattle branches wave, well, it ain't all damp and dismal, and it ain't all lonely grave. And, of course, there's no denying that the bushman's life is rough, 
but a man can ease his standard if he's built of sterling stuff. Though it's seldom that the drover gets a bed of Ida down, yet the man who's born a bushman, he gets mighty sick of town, for he's jotting down the figures and he's adding up the bills, while his heart is simply aching for a sight of southern hills. Then he hears a wool team passing with a rumble and a lurch, and although the work is pressing, yet it brings him off his perch. For it stirs him like a message from his station friends afar, and he seems to sniff the rangers in the scent of wool and tar, and it takes him back in fancy, half in laughter, half in tears, to a sound of other voices, and a thought of other years, when the wool-shed rang with bustle from the dawning of the day, and the shear blades were a-clicking to the cry of, Wool away! Then his face was somewhat browner, and his frame was firmer set, and he feels his flabby muscles with a feeling of regret. But the wool team slowly passes, and his eyes go sadly back to the dusty little table and the papers in the rack, and his thoughts go to the terrace where his sickly children squall, and he thinks there's something healthy in the bush life, after all. But we'll go no more a-droving in the wind or in the sun, for our father's hearts have failed us, and the droving days are done. There's a nasty dash of danger where the long-horned bullock wheels, and we like to live in comfort and to get our regular meals. And to hang around the townships suits us better, you'll agree, and a job at washing bottles is the job for such as we. Let us herd into the cities, let us crush and crowd and push, till we lose the love of roving and we learn to hate the bush. For we'll turn our aspirations to a city life and beer, and we'll slip across to England, it's a nicer place than here. For there's not much risk of hardship where all comforts are in store, and the theatres are plenty, and the pubs are more and more. But that ends it, Mr Lawson, and it's time to say good-bye. We must agree to differ in all friendship, you and I, and our personal opinions, well, they're scarcely worth a rush. For the some that like the city, and the some that like the bush. And there's no one quite contented, as I've always heard it said, except one favoured person, and he turned out to be dead. So we'll work out our own salvation with the stoutest hearts we may, and if fortune only favours, we will take the road some day, and go droving down the river neath the sunshine and the stars, and then return to Sydney and vermilionise the bars. The Banjo End of In Answer to Various Bards Poem 8 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Timothy Ferguson The Poets of the Tomb by Henry Lawson Subtitle for the Bulletin the world has had enough of bards who wish that they were dead. Tis time that people passed a law to knock them on the head. For twould be lovely if their friends could grant the rest they crave, those bards of tears and vanished hopes, those poets of the grave. They say that life's an awful thing, and full of care and gloom, they talk of peace and restfulness connected with the tomb. They say that man is made of dirt, and die of course he must, but all the same a man is made of pretty solid dust. There is a thing that they forget, so let it here be writ, that some are made of common mud, and some are made of grit. Some try to help the world along, while others fret and fume, and wish that they were slumbering in the silence of the tomb. Twixt and mother's arms and coffin gear, a man has work to do, and if he does his very best, he mostly worries through, and while there is a wrong to right, and while the world goes round, an honest man alive is worth a million underground. And yet, as long as she oaks sigh and wattle blossoms bloom, the world shall hear the drivel of the poets of the tomb. And though the graveyard poets long to vanish from the scene, I notice that they mostly wish their resting place kept green, 
Now, were I rotting underground, I do not think I'd care if wombats rooted on the mound, or if the cows camped there. And should I have some feelings left when I have gone before, I think a ton of solid stone would hurt my feelings more. Such wormy songs of mouldy joys can give me no delight. I'll take my chances with the world. I'd rather live and fight, though fortune laughs along my track, or wears her blackest frown. I'll try to do the world some good before I tumble down. Let's fight for things that ought to be, and try to make them boom. We cannot help mankind when we are ashes in the tomb. Sydney, September 92, Henry Lawson End of The Poets of the Tomb Poem 9 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug Up the Country by Henry Lawson I am back from up the country, very sorry that I went, seeking for the southern poet's land whereon to pitch my tent. I have lost a lot of idols which were broken on the track, burned a lot of fancy verses, and I am glad that I am back. Further out may be the pleasant scenes of which our poets boast, but I think the country's rather more inviting round the coast. Anyway, I'll stay at present at a boarding house in town, drinking beer and lemon squashes, taking baths and cooling down. Sunny plains! Great Scott! Those burning wastes of barren soil and sand, with their everlasting fences stretching out across the land. Desolation where the crow is, desert where the eagle flies, paddocks where the loony bullock starts and stares with reddened eyes, where, in clouds of dust enveloped, roasted bullock drivers creep slowly past the sun-dried shepherd dragged behind his crawling sheep, stunted peak of granite gleaming, glaring like a molten mass turned from some infernal furnace on a plain devoid of grass. Miles and miles of thirsty gutters, strings of muddy water-holes in the place of shining rivers, walled by cliffs and forest bowls, barren ridges, gullies, ridges, where the ever-maddening flies, fiercer than the plagues of Egypt, swarm about your blighted eyes, bush, where there is no horizon, where the buried bushman sees nothing, nothing but the sameness of the ragged, stunted trees, lonely hut where drought's eternal, suffocating atmosphere, where the god-forgotten hatter dreams of city life and beer. Treacherous tracks that trap the stranger, endless roads that gleam and glare, dark and evil-looking gullies hiding secrets here and there. Dull dumb flats and stony rises where the toiling bullocks bake, and the sinister Gohanna and the lizard and the snake. Land of day and night, no morning freshness and no afternoon, when the great white sun in rising bringeth summer heat in June. Dismal country for the exile, when the shades begin to fall from the sad heart breaking sunset to the new chum worst of all. Dreary land in rainy weather, with the endless clouds that drift o'er the bushman like a blanket that the Lord will never lift. Dismal land when it is raining, growl of floods, and oh, the whoosh of the rain and wind together on the dark bed of the bush. Ghastly fires in lonely humpies, where the granite rocks are piled in the wind-swept wildernesses that are wildest of the wild. Land where gaunt and haggard women live alone and work like men, till their husbands, gone a-droving, will return to them again. Homes of men! If home had ever such a God-forgotten place, where the wild selector's children fly before a stranger's face. 
home of tragedy applauded by the dingo's dismal yell heaven of the shanty keeper fitting fiend for such a hell and the wallaroos and wombats and of course the curlew's call and the lone sundowner tramping ever onward through it all i am back from up the country up the country where i went seeking for the southern poet's land whereon to pitch my tent i have shattered many idols out along the dusty track burned a lot of fancy verses and i'm glad that i am back i believe the southern poet's dream will not be realized till the plains are irrigated and the land is humanized i intend to stay at present as i said before in town drinking beer and lemon squashes taking baths and cooling down henry lawson end of up the country Poem ten of the Bush Debate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. In Defence of the Bush by A. B. Banjo Patterson. So you're back from up the country, Mr. Lawson, where you went, and you're cursing all the business in a bitter discontent. Well, we grieve to disappoint you, and it makes us sad to hear that it wasn't cool and shady, and there wasn't plenty beer, and the loony bullock snorted when you first came into view. Well, you know it's not so often that he sees a swell like you, and the roads were hot and dusty, and the plains were burnt and brown, and no doubt you're better suited drinking lemon squash in town. Yet perchance if you should journey down the very track you went in a month or two at furthest, you would wonder what it meant. Where the sun-baked earth was gasping like a creature in its pain, you would find the grasses waving like a field of summer grain, and the miles of thirsty gutters blocked with sand and choked with mud, you would find the mighty rivers with a turbid sweeping flood, for the rain and drought and sunshine make no changes in the street, in the sullen line of buildings and the ceaseless tramp of feet, but the bush hath moods and changes as the seasons rise and fall, and the men who know the bushland, they are loyal through it all. But you found the bush was dismal and a land of no delight. Did you chance to hear a chorus in the shearers' huts at night? Did they rise up William Riley by the campfire's cheery blaze? Did they rise him as we rose him in the good old droving days? and the women of the homesteads, and the men you chanced to meet, with their faces sour and saddened like the faces in the street, and the shy selected children, were they better now or worse than the little city urchins who would greet you with a curse? Is not such a life much better than the squalid street and square where the fallen women flaunt it in their fierce electric glare? Where the sempstress plies her sewing, till her eyes are sore and red in a filthy, dirty attic, toiling on for daily bread. Did you hear no sweeter voices in the music of the bush than the roar of trams and buses and the war-whoop of the push? Did the magpies rouse your slumber with their carols sweet and strange? Did you hear the silver chiming of the bell-birds on the range? But, perchance, the wild bird's music by your senses was despised, for you say you'll stay in townships till the bush is civilised. Would you make it a tea garden, and on Sundays have a band, where the blokes might take their dooners with a public close at hand? You had better stick to Sydney and make merry with the bush, for the bush will never suit you, and you'll never suit the bush. The Bulletin, 23rd of July, 1892 End of In Defence of the Bush by A.B. Banjo Patterson Poem 11 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Fact of the Matter by Edward George Dyson. I'm wondering why those fellers who go building chipper ditties about the rosy times out droving and the dust and death of cities don't sling the bloomin' office, strike some drover for a billet, and soak up all the glory that comes handy while they fill it. Perhaps it's fun to travel cattle or to picnic with merinos, but the drover don't catch on, sir, not much high-class rapture he knows. As for sleeping on the plains there in the shatter of the spear grass, that's like best by the juggins with a spring bed and a pier glass. And the campfire and the freedom and the blanky constellations, the possum rug and billy and the togs and stale old rations. It's strange they're only raved about by coves that dress up pretty and sport a wife and live on slap-up tucker in the city. I've tickled beef in my time clear from Clark to Riverina and shifted sheep all round the shop, but blow me if I've seen a single blanky hand who didn't buck at pleasures of this kidney and wouldn't trade his blisses for a flutter down in Sydney. Night watches are delightful when the stars are really splendid to the chap who's fresh upon the job, but you bet his rapture's ended when the rain comes down in sluice heads or the cutting hailstones pelter and the sheep drift off before the wind, and the horses strike for shelter. Don't take me for a howler, but I find it come annoying to hear these fellers rave about the pleasures we're enjoying, when perhaps we've nothing better than some fluky water handy, and they're right on all the liquors, rum, and plenty beer and brandy. The town is dusty, maybe, but it isn't worth the curses, sighed the dust of feller swallers and the blind thirsty nurses. When he's on the hard macadam, where the jumbucks cannot browse in, the wind is in his whiskers, and he follows twenty thousand. It's droving on the plain too, it's all okay, when the weather isn't hot enough to curl the soles right off your upper leather, or so cold that when the morning wind comes hissing through the grasses, you can feel it cut your eyelids like a whiplash as it passes. Then there's bull ants in the blankets, and a lame horse and mosquitoes, and a DT boss like Halligan, or one like Humpy Peters, who is mean about the tucker, and can curse from start to sundown, and can fight like fifty devils, and whose growlers never run down. Yes, I wonder why the fellers what go building chipper ditties about the rosy times out droven, and the dust and death of cities, don't sling the bloomin' office, strike old Peters for a billet and soak up all the glory that comes handy while they fill it. End of The Fact of the Matter Poem 12 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug The City Bushman by Henry Lawson It was pleasant up the country, City Bushman, where you went, For you sought the greener patches, and you travelled like a gent, And you cursed the trams and buses, and the turmoil and the push, Though you know the squalid city needn't keep you from the bush, But we late you heard you singing of the plains where shade is not, and you mentioned it was dusty, all was dry, and all was hot. True, the bush hath moods and changes, and the bushman hath em too, for he's not a poet's dummy, he's a man, the same as you. But his back is growing rounder, slaving for the absentee, and his toiling wife is thinner than a country wife should be, for we notice that the faces of the folks we chance to meet should have made a greater contrast to the faces in the street. And, in short, we think the bushman's being driven to the wall, and it's doubtful if his spirit will be loyal through it all. Though the bush has been romantic, and is nice to sing about, there's a lot of patriotism that the land could do without, sort of British workman nonsense that shall perish in the scorn of the drover who is driven, and the shearer who is shorn, of the struggling western farmers who have little time for rest, and are ruined on selections in the sheep-infested west. 
the roving songs are very pretty but they merit little thanks from the people of a country in possession of the banks and the rise and fall of seasons suits the rise and fall of rhyme but we know that western seasons do not run on scheduled time for the drought will go on drying while there's anything to dry then it rains until you'd fancy it would bleach the sunny sky then it pelters out of reason for the downpour day and night nearly sweeps the population to the great australian bight it is up in northern queensland that the seasons do their best but it's doubtful if you ever saw a season in the west there are years without an autumn or a winter or a spring there are broiling junes and summers when it rains like anything in the bush my ears were open to the singing of a bird but the carol of the magpie was a thing i never heard once the beggar roused my slumbers in a shanty it is true but i only heard him asking who the blanky blank are you and the bell bird in the ranges but his silver chime is harsh when it's heard beside the solo of the curlew in the marsh yes i heard the shearers singing william riley out of tune saw him fighting round a shanty on a sunday afternoon but the bushman isn't always trapping brumbies in the night nor is he for ever riding when the morn is fresh and bright and he isn't always singing in the humpies on the run and the campfire's cheery blazes are a trifle overdone we have grumbled with the bushman round the fire on rainy days when the smoke would blind a bullock and there wasn't any blaze save the blazes of our language for we cursed the fire in turn till the atmosphere was heated and the wood began to burn then we had to wring our blueys which were rotting in the swags and we saw the sugar leaking through the bottoms of the bags and we couldn't raise a chorus for the toothache and the cramp while we spent the hours of darkness draining puddles round the camp would you like to change with clancy go a droving tell us true for we rather think that clancy would be glad to change with you and be something in the city but would give your muse a shock to be losing time and money through the foot rot in the flock and you wouldn't mind the beauties underneath the starry dome if you had a wife and children and a lot of bills at home did you ever guard the cattle when the night was inky black and it rained and icy water trickled gently down your back till your saddle-weary backbone fell a aching to the roots and you almost felt the croaking of the bullfrog in your boots sit and shiver in the saddle curse the restless stock and cough till a squatter's irate dummy cantered up to warn you off did you fight the drought and pleuro when the seasons were asleep falling she-oaks all the morning for a flock of starving sheep drinking mud instead of water climbing trees and lopping boughs for the broken-hearted bullocks and the dry and dusty cows do you think the bush was better in the good old droving days when the squatter ruled supremely as the king of western ways when you got a slip of paper for the little you could earn but were forced to take provisions from the station in return when you couldn't keep a chicken at your humpy on the run for the squatter wouldn't let you and your work was never done when you had to leave the missus in a lonely hut forlorn while you rose up willy riley in the days ere you were born ah we read about the drovers and the shearers and the like till we wonder why such happy and romantic fellows strike don't you fancy that the poets ought to give the bush a rest ere they raise a just rebellion in the overwritten west where the simple-minded bushman gets a meal and bed and a rum just by riding round reporting phantom flocks that never come where the scalper never troubled by the war-whoop of the push has a quiet little billet breeding rabbits in the bush where the idle shanty keeper never fails to make a draw and the dummy gets his tucker through provisions in the law where the labour agitator when the shearers rise in might makes his money sacrificing all his substance for the right where the squatter makes his fortune 
and the seasons rise and fall and the poor and honest bushman has to suffer for it all where the drovers and the shearers and the bushmen and the rest never reach the el dorado of the poets of the west and you think the bush is purer and that life is better there but it doesn't seem to pay you like the squalid street and square pray inform us city bushman where you read in prose or verse of the awful city urchin who would greet you with a curse there are golden hearts in gutters though their owners lack the fat and will back a teamster's offspring to outswear a city brat do you think we're never jolly where the trams and buses rage did you hear the gods in chorus when re Tural held the stage did you catch a ring of sorrow in the city urchin's voice when he yelled for billy elton when he thumped the floor for royce do the bushmen down on pleasure miss the everlasting stars when they drink and flirt and so on in the glow of private bars you were down on trams and buses or the roar of em you said and the filthy dirty attic where you never toiled for bread and about that selfsame attic lord wherever have you been for the struggling needlewoman mostly keeps her attic clean but you'll find it very jolly with the cuff and collar push and the city seems to suit you while you rave about the bush you'll admit that up the country more especially in drought isn't quite the el dorado that the poets rave about yet at times we long to gallop where the reckless bushman rides in the wake of startled brumbies that are flying for their hides long to feel the saddle tremble once again between our knees and to hear the stock whips rattle just like rifles in the trees long to feel the bridle leather tugging strongly in the hand and to feel once more a little like a native of the land and the ring of bitter feeling in the jingling of our rhymes isn't suited to the country nor the spirit of the times let us go together droving and returning if we live try to understand each other while we reckon up the div henry lawson end of the city bushman poem thirteen of the bush debate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by algie pug the overflow of clancy by h h c c probably henry lawson on reading the banjo's clancy of the overflow i've read the banjo's letter and i'm glad he's found a better billet than he had upon the station where i met him years ago he was slushy then for scotty for the bushland sent him dotty so he rose up william riley and departed down below he rolled up very gladly for he had bush fever badly when he left the smoke to wander where the wattle blossoms wave but a course of stag and brownie seems to make the bush-struck towny kind of weaken on the wattle and the bushman's lonely grave safe in town he spins romances of the bush until one fancies that it's old top boots and chorus kegs of rum and whips of grass and the sheep off camp go stringing when the boss in charge is singing whilst we blow the cool tobacco smoke and watch the white wreaths pass yet i guess the bee feels fitter in a vile shirt and hard hitter than he would weigh down the cooper in a flannel smock and moles for the city cove has leisure to indulge in stocks of pleasure but the drove is only pastimes cooking what's this on the coals and the pub hath friends to meet him and between the acts they treat him while he's swapping fairy twisters with the girls behind their bars and he sees a vista splendid when the ballet is extended and at night he's in his glory with the comic opera stars i am sitting very weary on a log before a dreary little fire that's feebly hissing neath a heavy fall of rain 
and the wind is cold and nipping, and I curse the ceaseless dripping as I slosh around for wood to start the embers up again. And in place of beauty's greeting, I can hear the dismal bleating of a ewe that's sneaking out among the marshes for her lamb. And for all the poet's skitin that a new chum takes delight in, the drover's share of pleasure isn't worth a tinker's dam. Does he sneer at bricks and mortar when he's squatting in the water after riding fourteen hours beneath a sullen weeping sky? Does he look aloft and thank it as he spreads his sodden blanket? For the drover has no time to spare, he has no time to dry. If the banjo's game to fill it, he is welcome to my billet. He can take a turn at droving, wages three and six a day, and his throat will get more gritty than mine will in the city, where with Mr. Lawson's squashes I can wash the dust away. End of the Overflow of Clancy Poem 14 of The Bush Debate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills. Banjo of the Overflow by Francis Kenner. I had written him a letter which I had, for want of better knowledge, given to a partner by the name of Greenhide Jack. He was shearing when I met him, and I thought perhaps I'd let him know that I was stiff, and maybe he would send a trifle back. My request was not requited, for an answer came indicted on a sheet of scented paper in an ink of fancy blue, and the envelope I fancy had an esquire to the clancy, and it simply read, I'm busy, but I'll see what I can do. To the vision land I can go, and I often think of banjo, of the boy I used to shepherd in the not so long ago. He was not the bushman's kidney, and among the crowds of Sydney he'll be more at home than mooning on the dreary overflow. He has clients now to fee him, and has friends to come and see him. He can ride from morn to evening in the padded handsome cars, and he sees the beauties blending where the throngs are never ending, and at night the wondrous women in the everlasting bars. I am tired of reading prattle of the sweetly lowing cattle, stringing out across the open with the bushmen riding free. I am sick at heart of roving up and down the country droving, and of alternating damper with the salt junk and the tea. And from sleeping in the water on the droving trips I've caught a lively dose of rheumatism in my back and in my knee. And in spite of verse it's certain that the sky's a leaky curtain, it may suit the banjo nicely, but it never suited me. And the bush is very pretty when you view it from the city, but it loses all its beauty when you face it on the pad. And all the wildernesses haunt you, and the plains extended daunt you, till at times you come to fancy that the life will drive you mad. But I somehow often fancy that I'd rather not be clancy, that I'd like to be the banjo where the people come and go, when instead of framing curses I'd be writing charming verses, though I scarcely think he'd swap me, Banjo, the Overflow. End of Banjo of the Overflow Poem 15 of The Bush Debate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. An Answer to Various Bards by Banjo Patterson. Well, I've waited mighty patient while they all came rolling in, Mr. Lawson, Mr. Dyson, and others of their kin, with their dreadful, dismal stories of the Overlander's camp, how his fire is always smoky and his boots are always damp, and they paint it so terrific it would fill one's soul with gloom. But you know they're fond of writing about corpses and the tomb, so before they curse the bushland, they should let their fancy range and take something for their livers, and be cheerful for a change. Now, for instance, Mr. Lawson, well, of course we almost cried at the sorrowful description 
how his little Arvy died, and we lacrimosed in silence when his father's mate was slain. Then he went and killed the father, and we had to weep again. Ben Duggan and Jack Denver too, he caused them to expire, and he went and cooked the gander of Jack Dunn of Nevertire. So, no doubt, the bush is wretched if you judge it by the groan of the sad and soulful poet with a graveyard of his own. And he spoke in terms prophetic of a revolution's heat, when the world shall hear the clamour of those people in the street. But the shearer chaps who start it, why he rounds on them in blame, and he calls them agitators, who are living on the game. But I overwrite the bushman, well. I own without a doubt that I always see a hero in the man from furthest out. I could never contemplate him through an atmosphere of gloom, and a bushman never struck me as a subject for the tomb. If it ain't all golden sunshine where the wattle branches wave, well, it ain't all damp and dismal, and it ain't all lonely grave, and, of course, there's no denying that the bushman's life is rough, but a man can easy stand it if he's built of sterling stuff, though it's seldom that the drover gets a bed of eider down, yet the man who's born a bushman, he gets mighty sick of town, for he's jotting down the figures and he's adding up the bills, while his heart is simply aching for the sight of southern hills. Then he hears a wood team passing, with a rumble and a lurch, and although the work is pressing, yet it brings him off his perch, for it stirs him like a message from his station friends afar, and he seems to sniff the ranges in the scent of wood and tar, and it takes him back in fancy, half in laughter, half in tears, to sound of other voices, and a thought of other years, when the woolshed rang with bustle from the dawning of the day, and the shearer blades were a-clicking to the cry of wool away. Then his face was somewhat browner, and his frame was firmer set, and he feels his flabby muscles with a feeling of regret, but the wool team slowly passes, and his eyes go sadly back to the dusty little table and the papers in the rack, and his thoughts go to the terrace where his sickly children squall, and he thinks there's something healthy in the bush life after all, but We'll go no more a-droving, in the wind or in the sun, for our father's hearts have failed us, and the droving days are done. There's a nasty dash of danger where the long-horned bullock wheels, and we like to live in comfort and to get our regular meals, for to hang around the township suits us better, you'll agree, and a job of washing bottles is the job for such as we. Let us herd into the cities, let us crush and crowd and push till we lose the love of roving and we learn to hate the bush and we'll turn our aspirations to a city life and beer and we'll slip across to England. It's a nicer place than here. For there's not much risk of hardship where all comforts are in store and the theatres are plenty and the pubs are more and more. But that ends it, Mr Lawson, and it's time to say good-bye for we must agree to differ in all friendship, you and I. So we'll work our own salvation, with the stoutest hearts we may, and, if fortune only favours, we will take the road some day, and go droving down the river, neath the sunshine and the stars, and then return to Sydney, and vermilionise the bars. End of An Answer to Various Bards By Banjo Patterson Poem 16 of The Bush Debate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Poets of the Tomb by Henry Lawson. The world has had enough of bards who wish that they were dead. Tis time the people passed a law to knock em on the head. For it would be lovely if their friends could grant the rest they crave, those bards of tears and vanished hopes, those poets of the grave. They say that life's an awful thing and full of care and gloom. They talk of peace and restfulness connected with the tomb. 
They say that man is made of dirt, and die, of course, he must. But all the same, a man is made of pretty solid dust. There is a thing that they forget, so let it here be writ, that some are made of common mud, and some are made of grit. Some try to help the world along, while others fret and fume, and wish that they were slumbering in the silence of the tomb. Twixt mother's arms and coffin gear a man has work to do, and if he does his very best he mostly worries through. And while there is a wrong to right, and while the world goes round, an honest man alive is worth a million underground. And yet, as long as she-oaks sigh and wattle-blossoms bloom, the world shall hear the drivel of the poets of the tomb. And though the graveyard poets long to vanish from the scene, I notice that they mostly wish their resting place kept green. Now, were I rotting underground, I do not think I'd care if wombats rooted on the ground, or if the cows camped there. And should I have some feelings left when I have gone before, I think a ton of solid stone would hurt my feelings more. Such wormy songs of mouldy joys can give me no delight. I'll take my chances with the world. I'd rather live and fight. Though fortune laughs along my track, or wears her blackest frown, I'll try to do the world some good before I tumble down. Let's fight for things that ought to be, and try to make em boom. We cannot help mankind when we are ashes in the tomb. End of the Poets of the Tomb